This is the story of Dracula, a creature who destroys all whom he touches. Dracula the terrifying, the feared, who sleeps in the tombs of the dead by day and arises at night to inflict his terror upon the innocent and the unsuspecting. Please try and understand. This is not Lucy, the sister you loved. It's only a shell, possessed and corrupted by the evil of Dracula. How do you destroy a fiend who has so far proven himself indestructible? Those who come to end his reign of terror stay to become his victims. Castle Dracula is somewhere here in Klausenberg. Will you tell me how I get there? Welcome back to Rabbit and Snail's Film Talk as we try and compile the 100 greatest films ever made, or at least the 100 greatest films, in our humble opinion. And I'm delighted to say we are joined by one half of the amazing Hammer Runners, Mr. Phil Campbell. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. And we're going to be talking about an amazing film with which you have, I suspect, a bit of a connection. A bit of a connection. Yes, mm. I had to talk about a Hammer film, having worked for them for it four years. We did. And I've picked Dracula. Ah. That's their original Dracula, the 1958 one they made. It was called Horror of Dracula in America because um, Universal at the time was still releasing the um, Bela Lugosi 1931 version out to various cinemas, believe mm. it or not, the certain showcases and things like that. Puffy Bela Lugosi. Yes, yes. yes. So um, yes. Hammer had to sort of change the name uh, over there anyway. But they would call it Dracula over here. Um, it was made a year after they'd made Curse of Frankenstein. Curse of Frankenstein being a big success, they then launched into doing or redoing all the Universal mm. titles, really. Um, and uh, it starred Christopher Lee, of course, as Dracula, and Peter Cushing as Van Helsing, directed by Terence Fisher, who I think was one of the better Hammer directors. Yes, he had was. a certain class to the way he directed. Everything looked good. I mean, production design was very important in this. It was shot down at Bray Studios, where they were shooting most of their films at that time. And um, it just looks really great, particularly now they've gone restored versions and digitally enhanced things. It, um, you watch it now and you can see how quite classy it was. It's a bit slow to start with, in my opinion. Um, Jimmy Sangster wrote the script. He kept it, actually, he tightened it up quite a lot because Bram Stoker's novel starts with um, Jonathan Harker, who's this chap who's brought into the castle Dracula to meet Dracula and is there to actually help him in the original story I think it's to help him uh, move his premises over to England because he ends up at Whitby and he's brought in to organise all that in Hammer's film he's brought in to help him with his library ah, Dracula's right. library and Jonathan Harker knows he's a vampire he actually goes there to try and destroy him so Jimmy sort of shortened it all down made it, and kept it all in Transylvania rather than going off to Whitby. Now, apparently, a lot of this was to try and make it a bit more interesting, but also budgetary reasons, because £80,000, I think, had a budget of. So they kept it all in one studio, one place. It's much easier to do it that way. But I think it works better, because mm. it's, it's, you know, it's 90 minutes and it's sort of entertaining all the way through, although I, I just felt it was a bit slow to begin with. But it builds. It builds on the fact that Dracula is... A vampire, you know, you don't, just don't notice that straight away. He just talks in a normal way. Completely different uh, from Bela Lugosi's Dracula, but probably done on purpose, again, with the universal sort of copyright. That's why in Curse of Frankenstein, why Christopher Lee's makeup is so different from Boris Karloff's. They wouldn't allow Boris Karloff's makeup or the monster to appear anything similar in, in Hammer's version. That's why Christopher Lee looks like a road accident. When he, <laughs> he's always horrible. He said yeah. nobody would sit with him at lunch. No, he always yeah. yellow, white, blue skin and scars all over his face. Completely different from Boris Carlos. And in many ways, um, Christopher Lee's Dracula is different again. He's younger, he's sexier, you know, he's taller. And of course, the big thing was in colour. Because everybody's seen the previous monster movies were all in black and white. And now, Hammer brought colour to the screen. The blood was red, very red mm. in places. Uh, and more dramatic, more more action once it gets going. It seems, to my opinion, it gets going once Peter Cushing turns up because he's so genuine. Everything he does... That happens in a lot of films, yeah. doesn't it? Let's <laughs> be honest. It's just the way he delivers all the lines. Mm. He's believed that he's there to sort this monster out, you know, when people start doubting him. Jonathan Hark goes there to do what he wants to do, gets bitten by a vampire, afraid he's going to become one, and, uh, in fact, he does become one, so he disappears. But he, he manages to leave his diary out 
in a place outside the castle for Peter Cushing to discover. And so Peter Cushing then goes to the castle, destroys Jonathan Harker, comes back again, then various other elements happen. But all the time he's trying to track down the vampire who goes backwards and forwards to mm. different places. Uh, and ultimately there's a classic end destruction scene, which until recently wasn't complete. I mean, anyone who's seen the film like I did way back in the 1970s and 80s um, would have discovered, and there are other pictures, you see other stills of Dracula disintegrating, and he hasn't, doesn't, doesn't come through on the film. It's sort of all cut short. Mm. It wasn't until literally uh, 2010, 2011, they found a Japanese print which, wow. which had these additional shots in which had been missing for such a long time. So when they did the Blu-ray, um, there was a, a nice uh, BFI um, restoration, restoration of it, yeah, which is really good. 2008 or something. Yeah, it looked really lovely. Uh, but then now, back in 2012, they've now managed to, from these Japanese prints, put in these missing shots. Wow. Which is um, which is really good because it wasn't sh nothing used to be shot for Hammer uh, particularly gory. They just used to shoot gory sequences, and the censor would come along and take them out. I mean, even when Brian and I worked there, they weren't shooting extra gory bits for the films. They might shoot an American version, like Horror Frankenstein, with the fingers going up, with one finger going up, things like that, where the monster does that. But they didn't sort of go, right, now we're going to do a Japanese version. So this sort of idea that Japanese like, like more gore, but they did, but Hammer used to shoot the sequences and then find the sense would want to take half of them out. And that's what happened with Dracula. So it's nice now you can see a, a complete version of the way it should be. And it, it is more dramatic. It, by today's standards, it's nothing. He, he pulls his skin off like this, you know, which is, is nothing. But then they thought it was, it was a bit too much. Yeah, a bit too much. But it was, I mean, for, as you say, followed a year on from The Curse of Frankenstein. Yes. But it was the one that really, it was the final nail in the vampire's <laughs> coffin, for want of a better phrase. Well, but it, it, it's really what set that, that gothic horror genre going for Hammer, wasn't it? It is, and it also it helped some Universal Pictures, believe it or not. Mm. They reckoned that help with that because it, it eighty thousand dollars uh, eighty thousand pounds to make made twenty five million apparently and it allegedly the chairman was supposed to say it almost it helped save them from bankruptcy at the time. Oh, yes, so indeed. despite the conflict between Universal and Hammer with copyright issues, um because they were distributing it in America it, it made a lot of money for them. But out of all the Hammer films you could have chosen, I mean it's it's gonna be one of it's one of the classics. It is one of yeah it is one of the best because it just looks so good and uh, so much integrity went into it, I think. But you worked on a Hammer on a an, a Dracula film yourself, AD seventy two, which yes, that's not bad. Well, some people hate it. Some people, I, most people hate it for the stone ground and the music and the, the dialogue, which didn't exist. Hey man, nobody talked like that. Anyway, everybody was walking around going, "Why are people talking like this? We don't talk like this now." It was made in nineteen seventy two. May have done in nineteen sixty seven or something like in America, but so it didn't mm. really work. But I think Alan Gibson's direction was quite good. Um, with the opening sequence and the end sequences and things like that were, were good. It was quite fun. I quite liked that one. Scars of Dracula I worked on it was very gory, but they made it as gory as possible. But it was basically the same story as the original. That was the Jenny Handley, wasn't yes, it? Yes, that's right. Mm. The same coming to the castle and having his assistant and everything else and Clove and all that malarkey and it was um, it was very similar, but uh, didn't quite have the atmosphere, I'm afraid. But the 1958 Dracula, that's the one that's that the goes one on our watch. list of the 100 greatest films. Eight, nine, ten out of ten. Uh, I give it nine out of ten, only because it's just a bit too slow to begin with. Okay, if it's well, a little bit pacier, a... if Sangster had got it a bit pacier well, you, in the beginning, you later it could have on, been a 10. Later on in the, in the movies they, they made, they would have like a, a, almost a pre-title sequence of something dramatic happening. Mm. They went, oh, God, this is going to be a scary movie. But, of course, the first time they made it, it just sort of follows the story. Okay. So, it's a, but, you know, it's good. It's very good. But a 9 out of 10 for Dracula, the 1958 Hammer Films Dracula. Great movie. On Blu-ray as well, with the various versions and the new Japanese elements to make it truly complete. A worthwhile addition and a great addition to our top 100 films of the greatest films ever made. Phil, thank you very much. If you agree with Phil and us, please leave a comment down below. Tell us what you think. Uh, if you don't agree, leave a comment anyway. But either way, don't forget to subscribe to our channel because we do welcome you as visitors and love you as visitors and viewers. So, But thank you to Phil and thank you to Dracula. Yeah.